Hello, I'm Dr. Bridget Nash, and I'd like to welcome you to The Therapy Show, a podcast series that seeks to demystify mental health treatment. Today, I'm honored to welcome Dr. Sue Johnson, founder of the therapeutic model, Emotionally Focused Therapy, which is commonly referred to as EFT. EFT is best known as a cutting edge, tested and proven couples therapy intervention, but it is also used to address individual depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress. Dr. Johnson is the author of many books, including Hold Me Tight, Love Sense, and Creative for Connection. Dr. Johnson, welcome to The Therapy Show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Can you start by telling us a little bit about your personal background and professional development that led to your developing emotionally focused therapy? Sure. Basically, I did a doctorate many years ago in Canada, in British Columbia, and I was interested in every form of therapy. I worked with groups and with individuals and with families, and then I started seeing distressed couples, and there was something about distressed couples that really impacted me. I realized that when you're in a very distressed relationship where you feel lonely, and not nurtured, you're much more likely then to become depressed or to develop a problem with anxiety. It's almost like any other problem you have becomes more exaggerated and more difficult to deal with. And of course, if a couple aren't getting along, you're much more likely to have a hard time cooperating as parents. So then you get problems in the family and with kids. So I saw how people got really stuck in distressed relationships. They got stuck in patterns that just kind of took them over and kept that distress going. They got stuck in dances, ways of dancing together that really kept generating distress in the relationship and personal desperation. And I got fascinated by it, but I also understood that psychology therapy didn't really know how to help people. (laughs) So I read books on teaching couple skills and that didn't seem to help people at all because when people are very distressed and fighting and feeling lonely and not loved, they can't go in their head and use all these nice, clean couple communication skills. I tried giving people insight and that didn't seem to work. And then I just did what I've been taught to do in other forms of therapy, which is I started really tuning and then listening to people and helping them sort out their emotions, really get clear about their emotions, listen to them, and change the emotional signals they sent to their partner. And what happened next just blew my mind. I started to take my couple sessions, learn from my couples, and write all the things I was finding out down. People were focused very much on stopping conflict with couples. But what I saw was that conflict was just the inflammation. It was really the virus was that the couple had lost their safety together. They couldn't nurture each other anymore. They couldn't support each other. They couldn't answer their their bonding and attachment needs for someone to be close and caring with them. They were both lonely and desperate. And they'd get caught in a a pattern where one person was sort of yelling, where are you, where are you, and often getting very critical, and another person was protecting themselves and shutting down. They were feeling criticized and rejected, and the more one person shut down, the more the other person yelled louder, and couples would just get stuck in this. But what I saw was that when you help people understand what I just said and understand their emotions and their needs, and you help people learn to turn and have these supportive conversations, everything started to shift. And I became completely fascinated with this. I just had to keep studying it. And at the same time, it was amazing, my colleagues in social psychology started writing about adult attachment and pointing out that the kind of emotional bond that we saw between mothers and infants didn't end when the infant reached six or even when the adolescent reached 12, that this was just part of who we are, that we're bonding mammals. We, our relationships are where we decide who we are. We decide how dangerous life is. We decide whether we can deal with life. We decide whether other people are safe. This 
the science of adult bonding just started to take off. And we were part of it. We were the clinical part of it. And we started just using this approach and developing it, getting better and better at it, using it with more and more people, using it with couples that weren't just facing relationship distress, but facing depression, facing anxiety, facing post-traumatic stress disorder, using it with military couples. We work with lots of military couples. Using it all over the world, we now have centers in almost every country in the world. We teach an enormous number of therapists and mental health professionals to work with couples and families in this way and actually to work with individuals now. And it's really a way of seeing people through the lens of understanding who we are, which is that we're bonding mammals who need other people who constantly decide who we are in our main relationships and that we start to understand that we can help individuals and couples and families by using this way of seeing people and helping them accept their needs, understand their fears, and deal with their fears and needs in these dramas with the people that really matter to them. So it's it's been an amazing ride over the last 35 years. Now we're moving into health. The last project we did, we got a, a huge research grant to look at helping couples where one person's had a heart attack. And we developed an educational program based on my best-selling book for the public, Hold Me Tight, Seven Conversations for a Lifetime of Love. That has given birth to about five educational programs. And we have just done one for cardiac couples. And the preliminary results suggest that one of the very best things you can do for someone who's just had a heart attack is give them this 16-hour, eight-week educational group with them and their partner to help their partner become a team around dealing with the heart attack, to help the partners talk about the fears that come up from the heart attack, to help them support each other. It's really interesting. People's health improves their willingness to take their meds, to go to the gym improves, their blood pressure goes down because they feel safer with their partner, their partner feels less scared. Really, this is a therapy that recognizes how relational we are and helps people deal with their emotions differently, more adaptively in the context of our relationships. That's basically what it is. And It's grown amazingly over the last 35 years. It's changed the field of couple therapy for sure. There are EFT therapists who have studied with us on every city in North America, and they've had training in the most tested, proven, systematic way of healing relationships that exists right now. So we are very proud of how our work has grown. So how would you briefly explain EFT to a non-professional? EFT is now used with individuals, couples, and families, but we're best known for our work with couples. But I explain EFT to someone who doesn't understand particularly about labels, that we really help people understand their emotions better because we see how powerful emotions are. They color our inner world and they shape our relationships with other people. So we help people understand their emotions, see the logic in their emotions, deal with their emotions differently. And part of that is that emotions are the music of the dance with other people. So we also help people shift the way they turn up in their in, a, in their relationships with others. This can be in reality in a room with your partner, or we create new kinds of conversations that create secure bonds. And we've shown in our research that we can create secure bonds, not just improve the way you communicate or stop you fighting so much, but actually create more secure emotional bonds. We've shown that in our research. So we can help you change your relationship. But sometimes, you know, people might live alone and they might be depressed and they're always having these conversations in their head 
with the important people in their lives. And these conversations always end up with terrible conclusions about how inadequate they are or how they don't deserve love or how they've got to criticize themselves all the time or how being alone is inevitable. If we're doing individual therapy, we help people deal with their emotions differently and then go into these imaginary encounters with the important people that they're always talking to in their head and help them have new kinds of conversations with those people, which shifts how they feel about themselves and shifts how they feel about other people. So we're really changing relationships. And as relationships change, you change how you deal with your emotions, how you see yourself. And we're also changing emotionally how you connect to yourself. And that changes relationships. So it's a very supportive, collaborative therapy. It's a therapy that doesn't like labels. We deal with clients. We deal with Jim and Ted and Sarah and Mary. We deal with couples and families. We deal with the whole person. We don't label you with these labels. We find that that's not useful to us. Each person is the same. We're all bonding human beings. We all are terrified of loneliness and rejection. We all need closeness and connection and support. But we're also all different. So it's a very humanistic, supportive, collaborative therapy where the therapist comes in and helps you sort out and find the logic in your emotional world and then helps you shift how you relate to the most important people in your lives. When and how did you realize that EFT would be an effective form of therapeutic intervention? (laughs) Well, I knew that something was happening in my office because it was really exciting and I couldn't find it in any book. So I knew that there was something interesting happening here. And I still feel the same excitement when somebody just sent me a tape to look at from Turkey and they're going to become a trainer in EFT. And I was looking at her tape and I still feel the same excitement because she's just sitting there helping this couple repair their relationship, which has been distressed forever, helping them find new aspects of themselves, helping them talk to their partner in ways that they never imagined being able to talk to anyone. So that persuades me always. When we teach professionals, we show what we do. We show tapes. There's lots of tapes of therapists doing EFT. We believe in being transparent. We show what we do. So I know that good things are happening when I do my own sessions or when I see these sessions. But also, what I first realized was when those research results rolled out of that machine. As I remember, it was a small dark room. I was a graduate student. The results were sort of rolling out of this printer. These pages were kind of falling on the floor and I was putting them together. And I sort of looked at it and thought, well, that's amazing. And I thought, well, that can't be right. It, it, it can't possibly, it can't, can't possibly be right. I mean, I knew that something amazing was happening in those sessions, but it can't possibly be right. So I did it. I ran it through another three times and the results were amazing. <laughs> and I, I'm happy to tell you that we've done over 20 studies since that time. And the results have been uniformly positive. For couples therapy, we've done more research on couples than we have on individuals working with depression and anxiety or distressed families. So in couples therapy, when we look at our research studies, sort of link them together, we expect about 75% of couples to go through 8 to 20 sessions of EFT and to be non-distressed at the end and to continue to be non-distressed. There's no evidence of relapse in EFT, which is pretty astounding. And I think it's because we show these couples how to have these powerful bonding conversations, and they are so rewarding and so great for people that they just go out and keep doing it. If they keep doing it, they don't relapse. So our studies have been very successful We get about 75% of couples out of distress, and we get about 86% of couples who aren't quite out of distress, but who tell us that really their relationship has significantly changed 
the thing is, you can help people deal with a few symptoms, whether you're working with a distressed relationship or whether you're working with individual depression. You can help people deal better with a few little symptoms. Lots of things can help you do that. Actually, medication can help you do that. I think it's another thing to look for a therapist who's going to help you really grow as a person and help you not just deal with one little problem, but help you really look at your life and see where you want to be, what kind of relationship you want to have, how you want to feel about yourself, and know how to move there, know how to grow as a person. EFT is all about growth and all about understanding relationships and understanding how we put our, our emotions together and helping people grow to be the best and the happiest they can be. You know, I don't just want my couples to stop fighting. I want my couples to be able to turn and confide their needs and fears, support each other, and create these amazing, secure attachments, which we know from research makes us resilient, makes us feel strong, makes us be able to deal with stress, impacts our physical health, makes us feel good, give us a good self-image, makes us feel safe with other people. We're pretty ambitious. We want to create lasting, significant change. So our research results persuade me and our clinical work persuades me. And all these therapists all over the world learning our approach persuade me that we can do this. Here's another question I think you've already answered. So, so who is EFT most effective for and why should people choose an EFT intervention? Well, one reason to choose EFT intervention, especially for couple problems, is it's got the best research by far of anyone in the field. It's the only approach to couple therapy that has proved again and again that it's effective. It's the only approach to couple therapy that has proved that it can create change without relapse. It's the only approach to couple therapy that has proved that it not only helps people fight less, cooperate more, but creates this emotional security that we're all longing for, creates this emotional bond. From that point of view, I think it's a pretty obvious choice if you're in a distressed relationship. We haven't done as much research on families. It's taken us a while to, we've done a lot, but there's a lot to do. So we've worked with families and we need to do research on that. If I was looking for a family therapist, I think I would go to EFT because I think we understand the emotional bonds in families and we don't blame people for their problems. We don't tell people that they're bad, their kids acting out because they're bad parents. And we understand what's going on in the family and we know how to help people move into these secure bonding interactions. So I would, I would do that. If I was an individual, I think I'd go to EFT, not because of the research, because we're still doing that. We're still, we're just really moving into doing research on individual therapy. I'd probably go to an EFT therapist because I'd feel safe there. I'd know that I wasn't going to be labeled or told that I didn't think logically or that I had to cope with my emotions in this way that was in this manual. I think I'd go to feel heard and understood. And I'd want somebody who had a map to my deepest fears and deepest needs, which we do in EFT because we've spent 35 years listening to people's emotions. We know how they make sense. So I'd probably go for that reason. And, and also because I'd look at other research and I'd read about dealing with these emotions in a particular way and engaging with others in a particular way creates more secure personalities. And that's what we're trying to do in EFT. We're trying to create people who feel good about themselves and who can cope with their world and engage with others in ways that has others nurture them. So, of course, I'm massively biased here, but I have problems with parts of the therapy world who are intent on labeling people and putting people into categories and then sort of coming up with set formulas 
telling people to change how they think or you're depressed because all your thoughts are illogical. If somebody says that to me, I just feel more depressed than ever. And it's kind of the wrong channel. I think the public, if you talk to most people in the public, they know if they really listen to themselves, they know that to really shift mental health problems or negative relationships, you need to go into the emotional channel and deal differently with your emotions. The public knows that. And that's what this therapy does. So we do have research that it works with couples where there's people are depressed, where people have PTSD. It helps the relationship. It reduces the symptoms. If you're lonely, if you feel alone in the world, every single individual problem you have starts to go through the roof because we're not wired to deal with these problems alone. We're just not wired for it. It's not about how strong we are as personalities. We're just not wired for it. So we know that we help all kinds of couples with post-traumatic stress disorder in the military. And in our offices, we help individuals with PTSD, trauma, depression, anxiety. But really, our work particularly stands out with couples. If I was having distress in my relationship, I would definitely go find an EFT therapist. There are so many folks out there in the couple therapy world with good intentions who call themselves couples therapists and who really have had no training whatsoever. So if I was a member of the public, and one of the reasons I'm talking to you on this podcast is that I feel very strongly about this, the public need to know that 70% of mental health professionals see couples, and very, very, very many of them have had no training whatsoever. They think that all they have to do is sit and chat to a couple in a room. And really, there's a whole science of relationships And there's a whole science of working with distressed relationships. And that's just not good enough. Therapists can hurt people. They can blame people for their relationship problems. They can label people. They can actually hurt people if they don't understand relationships. So particularly if you've got in a distressed relationship, I'd go find a trained EFT therapist. I also thought while I was listening that it would be great as a preventative measure as well. Like, I don't know if you're doing any studies on young kids and adolescents. Yeah, we we have the Hold Me Tight book, my Hold Me Tight book, which is still best selling after all these years. That spawned education programs. And we have an education program called Hold Me Tight, Let Me Go for Families helping adolescents hold on to their families while also becoming more independent. So we are looking at that. We're looking at how to educate families as well as look at how to educate the primary partners. But you're right. We need to educate the public in general about attachment and bonding. It's really educating them about their own emotions and their emotional needs. Attachment has change the way we parent our kids in the last 40 years. We no longer drop our kids off at the hospital and pick them up a week later after they've been operated on. We tend to forget that that was the norm in the 1960s, which isn't that long ago. We don't do that because we understand it would traumatize the child. So this attachment science has already revolutionized parenting, and now it's time for it to revolutionize psychotherapy for adults and how adults learn about their relationship. We need to educate people about their love relationships because now there's a science of love. It's not true that love is a mystery. It's something that comes and hits you in the head, that you fall into it and you fall out. That's Hollywood and poetry through the ages. That's not true. There's a science of love, just like there's a science of dentistry, how to clean your teeth, how to stop your teeth from rotting. We depend on science so much in the rest of our lives. It's time to get that we can understand our relationships in the same way as we understand the physical world. It's empowering for people to get that, but we have to educate people. We do hold me tight groups for couples, which are preventative 
They're all over the world in all the major cities. EFT therapists put on educational groups for couples called Hold Me Tight groups. There's even now a Hold Me Tight online course that people can do with their partner in their own home. You can go to holdmetightonline.com. So we're trying to tell couples it's preventative and it keeps your relationship going. You can fall in love again and again. There is no best before date with love. This is a mistake. It, we haven't known how to understand it. We haven't known how it works. So this is a big deal because We flourish and we're strongest and we're most mentally healthy and most able to cope when we're standing next to someone who we know has our back, who will support us. We flourish in good, close relationships. So, yeah, our education programs are really geared to prevention. They're really geared to educating people about this new science of love. So what's the average length of treatment for somebody working with EFT? If you're in a distressed relationship, Most people in North America and Canada, people wait about five or six years often before they come in. In some parts of the world, it's much longer. So they've practiced being distressed for quite a while when they come in. (laughs) (laughs) And they're pretty stuck in their ways of dancing together. But EFT usually takes about, if you're in serious distress, it takes about eight to 20 sessions with a therapist, although we've had people come to our Hold Me Tight education groups, which are usually done over a weekend, and tell us that they've improved, they've understood so much from those groups. But basically, if you're going to really work on your relationship, it takes from 8 to 20 sessions. Families, we usually only see about 10 times. Individuals, it really depends on what you're dealing with. I see individuals sometimes only about five times. I also see some individuals for about a year. It depends on what they're dealing with. Couples who are dealing with trauma, someone who's got serious PTSD, for example, and also a very distressed relationship, and the two, of course, feed each other. The more PTSD symptoms you have, usually the worse your relationship, the worse your relationship the worse your PTSD symptoms get. So these people are caught in a trap. And those folks, it takes a bit longer because you're dealing with a lot of difficult emotions, a lot of fear about trusting other people, often a lot of shame about you. People feel that they should be able to cope with everything, right? So if they're traumatized, it must be their fault. So you're dealing with a lot, a lot, and that often takes longer. It's hard to guess, but where we used to work at the hospital and we'd see very serious folks with a lot of trauma history in their life, we would work with those couples about 30 times. But when you really think about that, 30 times to renew a relationship, make it into a strong bond that's going to support you in the rest of your life 30 times, 30 hours, so that rather than going cutting yourself or drinking or destroying your relationships, you learn that you can wake up in the middle of the night and touch your partner on the shoulder and say, it's come for me again. All my nightmares have come for me. And that partner knows what's going on and understands enough to just turn and hold you so that your whole nervous system calms down and you wake up in the morning feeling good about your partner, good about how you coped, and not so intimidated by the nightmares and stronger as a person. If you can get that kind of change in 30 hours, that's pretty good. So what are the most common obstacles or missteps that prevent therapists and patients alike from seeing the full benefit of EFT? Some therapists want very simple formulas. They don't want to engage with people emotionally. They find that difficult. So they want to teach people in a set way how they should think or to teach people coping strategies, which of course can be useful, right? If that's all you want, then that's useful. So therapists are like all other kinds of human beings. They Sometimes they want to avoid emotions completely. (laughs) So then they find learning EFT challenging. And learning EFT is like playing the piano. 
it's like learning anything worthwhile. You have to work at it a bit. So not all therapists will be attracted to EFT. I think psychotherapy in general has been a quite phobic of strong emotion, actually. Our whole culture has taught us to distrust emotion, that emotions are illogical and dangerous. We don't see it that way at all. We see emotion as uh, full of powerful wisdom about what's important to you and what you need. We just need to understand them and know how to handle them and work with them. So some therapists just won't want to work with people's emotions and won't want to learn EFT. Not everyone wants to do that. Some people just want to teach meditation skills or something like that. And EFT, we don't do couple therapy with clients where there's a lot of domestic violence. We can't. We, we have to be able to create safety to do what we do. We can't see couples where there's serious violence and somebody's really not taking responsibility for that violence. That doesn't work. So there's some folks who aren't really suited to EFT at least not at that point in their lives. If you have a serious addiction and you want to work in couple therapy, we tell you your addictive behavior is going to get in the way of improving your relationship. If you want to work with us, we expect to be successful. If you want to work with us, you have to also go and look at that addictive behavior and start changing that because otherwise... We're going to go two steps forward in couple therapy and then three steps back when you fall off the wagon into your addiction. It doesn't work. It's distressing for you. It's frustrating for us. So sometimes we say in order to work in our couples therapy, you have to also look at your particular problem like addiction, you know, and we will send you to someone to do that or we'll send you to individual EFT therapists to do that. So we set it up. But EFT is particularly suited to people who really want to understand their deepest needs and fears, want to understand their emotions, and want to find a way to connect with other people and have the desire, who are curious about themselves and want to understand themselves. Can you share any poignant examples where EFT had a major impact in someone's life? Without sharing any identifying information, of course. Oh, goodness me, there's so many. Like, for example, I can remember recently working with a couple where the man had a huge post-traumatic stress disorder from all kinds of deployments with the Canadian military. And he was highly suicidal and he was very difficult to deal with. The military just kept putting him on all kinds of different meds, which I don't think was helping at all. And this is what happens a lot. He was pushing his wife away, who was his main support. He was pushing her away with his anger and his irritability. And he also decided that he couldn't trust her because he decided that 30 years ago, she had had some sort of brief affair on him. This had never happened, but he decided that this was true. And so he was obsessed with this and pushed, blaming her and getting abusive and then ranting and then shutting down into depression and telling her he's going to commit suicide. And the military psychiatrists had basically given up on him. They sort of sent him to me. I don't know why they sent him to me, actually, to tell you the truth. They basically said, we can't help him. Let's see what you can do with him. So, <laughs> so I saw them as a couple. And this is often what happens in the couple therapy we do. I saw them as a couple. And if you do good EFT, you don't just help people have a better relationship. You help them move into a place where they can grow and heal each other. So I saw them as a couple. And I was able to get past his irritation, his anger, slow him down and help him make sense of what happened in the moment before he got enraged and nasty and hostile or even suicidal. What happened was he felt completely alone and so completely like he didn't mean anything to anyone. 
in which case his life would be meaningless and suicide was the best idea. And in those moments, what was key was never in his life had he felt secure with anyone but his wife, never. All growing up, he was abused and never had he felt secure with anyone. But in his deepest vulnerability, when all this PTSD came up, which came up when he stopped drinking. I mean, this man had so many problems. In his deepest, darkest moments, he'd think, well, at least I could depend on her. And this would sort of block out his terror. And then he'd decide, no, I I can't. She had that affair on me. And his whole world would collapse. So we were able to go into that. And we were able to help him talk about his fears Talk about how alone he'd been in his whole life. Talk about how it was such a risk for him to lean on her and believe in her. And talk about an incident in their relationship where he suddenly got scared all those years ago and decided he couldn't trust anyone. So then he drank and gone on deployments and then he stops drinking. So suddenly all this comes for him. And he was able to tolerate that fear with me and and understand it and listen to it and talk about it with his wife in a way that had her be able to be reassuring to him. And his whole way of dealing with his emotions starts to shift. And some of it was that she was able to see him and be there for him. And I only saw them... I don't know how many times now, 12 times. And their relationship just started to shift. And as he was able to lean on her and depend on her, and she was able to tell him also what she needed, because she certainly didn't need to be yelled at all the time and told that she'd had an affair. They were able to come and and make each other feel more secure. His PTSD symptoms started to be much more manageable, calmed down. So that's a good example of the kind of shift you can get if you go to the heart of the matter, if you go to the core things that organize us as human beings, our most basic emotions, our need for other people, and you start to shift that, then people find their resilience. And we have a lot of resilience. And I totally think that your project's really important. The the public need to be educated about how to use therapy, how to use therapy to help them grow and find the resilience that is there because we all have it. Thank you. So what are you most excited about in mental health treatment today? Oh, I've just written a new book. It was out in January. I'm most excited about taking all the stuff we've discovered with couples and families and systematically applying it to individuals. We've been doing it all these years. We just haven't been writing it down as we do it, systematically teaching it and doing studies on it. We've been doing it and we know it works. So I'm most interested in taking EFT and getting it out there as an individual treatment for depression and anxiety, we'll start a big new study in September where we will look at that because we always do the same thing. We look at something clinically, we understand it, we work it up, we share about it, we watch tapes, we make sure we're on target with a clinical intervention. Then we do a study. We learn from the study. Then we teach it to others. Then we learn more. I mean, this is what we've done for the last 35 years. So we're going to do this more systematically with individuals now. We've all worked with individuals all through the years, especially those facing trauma. But now we're going to do it more systematically. And I think some of it is that I've become frustrated with going to conferences And, you know, I've just said, well, it's enough for me to do, for us to do, to work in the couple and family field. You know, I'll leave individual therapy to others. But I've become so frustrated going to conferences and listening to people talk about the way they deal with individuals who've been traumatized. And to be honest, listening to them and thinking, that doesn't make any sense. We'd never do that. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, we sort of think, well, 
what the hell? You know, why aren't we? Why aren't we standing up and saying what we do? So, so I'm most excited about. I'm changing my clinical practice. I've just moved from the east coast to the west coast, and I'm changing my clinical practice. I'm opening it up again in a few months, and for the first time in 35 years. I'm just going to see individuals. I'm most excited about us moving into the individual therapy world. I think we have a lot to offer. And I think the more humanistic therapies, the therapies that are much more collaborative and much more interested in growth, they haven't followed the research path. So in some ways, they've fallen off the wagon. People can't get insurance for vague humanistic therapies, but people get insurance for EFT because we're accepted in the field. We've got brain scan studies. We've got outcome studies. So I want us to move into the individual psychotherapy world. Wow. That's amazing. So my next question is, if you had a magic wand and could improve one thing about mental health treatment, what would it be? I'd improve the training of mental health professionals. I'd improve their training. I try to stop this thing where many students are just taught one very narrow way of seeing people and treating people. The quality of mental health comes down to the way we train mental health professionals. We've spent the last 20 years educating health professionals, and we have 70 centers now in different countries. We have 75 trainers who go all over the world. Our latest thing is we've just gone into Iran, which people say, well, you can't go into Iran. It's a different culture. It's different. Well, what are you talking about? They're just human beings. Human beings, we're the same family. Of course, we can go into Iran. If they want us, we'll go. So we teach people all over the world. And I think we have to train therapists to really understand what human beings are. Not just, this is the symptoms of depression, this is how you tell people coping techniques. We have to train people how to understand human beings, and that's key. And if we don't do that, people will turn to quick, easy fixes for very complex problems, which always ends up being bad news. It's happening already. People are turning to drugs and apps for quick, easy fixes rather than knowing how to go to a website like yours where somebody talks to them about what are you looking for and how do you find a therapist who can help you? How do you make an informed choice? And knowing how to go to someone who will help them grow. I think when we all lived in small villages, we would go to the big grandfather in the village or we would go to the the wise our wise great-great-grandfather, you know, we don't live in those villages anymore, or we'd even go to our priest, or we'd go to our medical doctor. That doesn't happen anymore. We live pretty isolated lives. Often we don't have that past on wisdom. So some people would argue you can get it on the internet. You can get lots of things on the internet, but I'm not sure it's always wisdom. (laughs) So I think we need to educate health professionals better, and we need to educate the public to expect a different level of help and to know how to choose it, which is why I'm talking to you. Because I think if we had a whole bunch of people who are doing what you're doing, if we had, I don't know, 200 folks like you who were doing these dissertations and creating these websites and putting it out there, and telling people what they can expect from different kinds of therapy, telling people their names, telling people what's different about them, how to choose. I think that would be the most amazing service to mental health. Well, we plan to do that. I'm actually going to have a whole page on therapyshow.com dedicated to your work. So it'll have a link to, it'll have a link to your website, you know, your books, and it will have a link to how to find a therapist. There's actually a link, find a therapist link. And it's all going to be in one place. I totally applaud you for doing this. I think it's completely worthwhile. It should be all over the place. It, people go and they're, they're so vulnerable when they go to a therapist and they just show up. You know, they, oh, oh, somebody told me you were good. And they have no idea 
the different alternatives. They have no idea how to ask the therapist for their training. They have no idea. We hear horror stories all the time. I went to this therapist to talk about my relationship. They taught me communication skills for three sessions. And then they told me that the reason my marriage was on the rocks was because I was so bad at the communication skills. And this made me more depressed and it made my relationship worse. Or, or the therapist told me that we weren't soulmates and we should split up. I just feel like going and calling up that therapist and saying, I mean, maybe they didn't say that. That's the trouble. But if they did... That was amazingly naughty. So the public need to become more discerning and know the difference. This is a big issue in our society. Know the difference between an expert and somebody who just says they're an expert. You know, everybody is suddenly an expert on relationships. Every talk show host, every person who wants to be famous is suddenly an expert on relationships. Well, they're not. And they say a lot of really silly, harmful things. And the public believe them because they have no touchstone. They have no standard to know, except their own hearts, maybe, to say, that doesn't sound right. We have people out there now saying the best way to have a happy relationship is to make it a threesome and have an affair on the side. And what are you talking about? That's like the best way to decorate your house is to throw a bomb in it. Right. And then, I mean, that's the most, what are you talking about? Well, because, you know, that's sensationalist. And if I say that, it'll end up in the front of all the papers and then I'll get a lot of press. But the public don't know. People come up to me and they say, oh, don't you think this person's wonderful? And I, I, <laughs> I used to try and be polite. And now I just say, no, they're complete idiots. And what they say is absolute garbage. And all they care about is being famous. You shouldn't listen to them. They don't know anything about relationships. They don't even make sense. And people are horrified that they want me to say, oh, yes, this person is wonderful. And mm -hmm. the public don't have a way of judging. And that's distressing. It's like we've got all these doctors out there in mental health with all these credentials and they're putting out all these treatments and the public don't really have a way of knowing what's good and what isn't. So I think what you're doing is great. So Dr. Johnson, on behalf of myself, my listeners, and all of the people that you've helped through your work, I want to thank you for your contributions to mental health treatment and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to help me and my audience better understand the fields of emotionally focused therapy. You are most, most welcome. Good luck to you. Be sure to check out my website, therapyshow.com, which has many resources about mental health. There you will also find how to submit questions, stories, or insights that you have about the mental health system or suggestions about who else I can interview and how I can improve the show. I'd like to close by reminding our listeners to please subscribe, share, and review this podcast so you, someone you love, and people around the world can gain more benefit from therapy. There is no need to suffer in silence. Get the help that you need to create the life that you want.